Hi, Matt B here and welcome to M2M, the channel that burns the nonsense. Level Earth's Observer, he's up to it again. Anyway, before we start and get into that, uh, if you're new to the channel, please hit the subscribe button and push the bell notification and you'll be notified when I upload more videos. But the best thing you do is comment below, let me know how I'm doing and let me know how I can actually improve or whether I've said anything something stupid. So, what's he up to? Let's roll the credits and find out. So here it is, Level Earth Observer once again, uh, titled Flat Earth Apollo 9, preparing for the pantomime. The only pantomime is you, Adam. But anyway, let's find out and see what he's got to say. Apollo 9, the proving ground of the moon landing charade. Yeah, so here it is straight away. James McDevitt, he was the commander for Apollo 9. Um, for your information, Apollo 9 was the... Um, first test of the uh, lunar module uh, during the Apollo program um, and it was tested um, above low earth uh, orbit uh, to check out its uh, instruments and avionics and make sure it's all working properly so the practice was to uh, move apart from the command module uh, and then rendezvous again and uh, and redock uh, so that was the test so anyway let's see what Adam's got to say essentially testing maneuvers supposedly round the ball earth. Uh, not supposedly, it was the globe earth, Adam. Two craft, 100 miles apart, come together and dock whilst they're supposedly doing silly speeds around globe earth. Not silly speeds, Adam. They're uh, speeds that are necessary to keep in orbit, um, somewhere in the region of 17,500, 18,000 miles per hour, somewhere around the region preparing for the moon landing so let's have a listen to the story <clears throat> and let's break it down for the absurdity that it is we know the globe is scientifically impossible anyway now adam it's not scientifically problem uh scientifically impossible because you've never proved it as such so behave but let's just look at this globe evidence with a little bit of discernment and just break it down for the nonsense that it is so when we first got into orbit, we, were, we had a lot of stuff to do. And so we needed to make sure... Dear, oh dear. ...that we had the, all the data we could get. Again, nicknamed Spider. I'd call her Airfix. Well, to be honest with you, what we're actually seeing on the screen is a model. Uh, that's not the actual uh, lunar module. I'd call the old girl Airfix myself. The lunar module had to land on the moon. Uh, I mean, that's what it was designed for. And then it had to get back up to the command module so there, there was a ride home. How does that sports car handle, Jim? Again, I, I, I don't want to be rude or disrespectful, but I don't give up demonstrable reality in favour of stuff like we've got on our screen right now. I'm sorry. You're not sorry at all, Adam. Why would you apologise? Because this is reality. It's just that you can't see it and you won't accept it. That is clearly ridiculous. You see, this is all you've got. Once again, Adam, all you got is, look, that it looks ridiculous. Oh, it looks fake. But all your claims of looking of fake, you've never been able to prove uh, that it as it is fake or how it was fake. That's the same with all flat earthers. When we ask for, uh, for their claims of CGI and how it was uh, done, there's never a response. Never been able to prove it. Just listen to your mate there, trying to make this interaction seem real. When actually he's chatting to a fucking model. Two sex. 
How does that sports car handle, Jim? Pretty nice. It's really very difficult to get the coordinate system in your head. Normally we dock looking out this way, and for the, the dock you went to lunar module and all the this way. So the control system didn't didn't operate the way it normally would. It was the most complicated, messy system of springs and levers and latches and, and unbelievably complex. Did you hear that? A system of levers and springs and unbelievably complex. Listen to that. Levers and springs in the cold, dark void of pantomime space, the vacuum, where you get extreme temperatures of cold and heat. Oh, here we go. Here we go. This is where his misunderstanding is going to come in. And this extremely crude system works on levers and springs, as in incredibly complicated. <laughs> He's referring to the docking system, Adam. Nothing else. Can you see how ridiculous this is already? On a tower crane on the back, you've got the electric... Of course he's going to refer back to his cranes as all yours does, doesn't he? Electric box, which in the winter months has to be heated up with a radiator, which is already in there, I may add. If it isn't, the electrics, the whole crane, doesn't work. So you're comparing what happens on Earth to what happens in space. Oh, ridiculous because the temperature is too cold for the electrics, it won't work, and the crane shuts down. I've seen a billion pound project come to an absolute grinding halt with 12 tower cranes just stood there, whilst men were going up tower cranes with hair dryers trying to warm up the back box because they did Going up tower cranes with hair dryers. Hmm. Didn't tinker with the settings from summer to winter. My point is, imagine all this kit, this 1960s kit with springs and levers in the vacuum of space with the temperatures changing, getting extremely cold and then warm. I mean, come on, it doesn't take much to work out. This stuff's ridiculous. Ah, uh, you see, Adam, this is where your misunderstanding of how heat behaves in space comes in. It's a popular misconception that anything that ventures into space instantly freezes. But in reality, and I know how much you like that word, reality, or demonstrable reality, the vacuum of space is a near-perfect insulator because it lacks any kind of medium to remove heat. In fact, the vacuum of space heat is lost almost exclusively to electromagnetic radiation or light, Adam, especially in the infrared band. Now, this is a very slow process. Now, Adam, think about the thermos vacuum flask of hot drink I'm sure you take onto your current cab and those cold, rainy days to keep you war toasty warm. Between the outer layers of plastic and glass and the inner layers of your flask is a vacuum. Why do you think that vacuum is there, Adam? It's to keep your hot drink hot. Without it, your hot drink will lose its heat much faster. And we wouldn't want you getting too cold in your crane cab now, would we, Adam? Or would we? Besides that, NASA managed, to th managed uh, thermal radiation by various means, including building the spacecraft with multiple layers of uh, various materials, including reflective materials like malar, the stuff that emergency blank blankets are made of. So there we are, Adam. That just explains your silly theory, doesn't it? Let's see what else he's got to say. Demonstrable reality tells us anyway, but even their own claims, their own footage, models, it clearly is ridiculous. And if you... No, demonstrable reality is what I've just explained, Adam. Your reality is far from real. Just wanted a bit more footage to get you salivating over the daftness that is NASA and Apollo 9. We'll just have one last look at this pantomime that is Apollo 9. <laughs> the only pantomime is your knowledge, Adam. <laughs> Bear with me. This is some more footage of them practicing the docking procedure, supposedly around a ball of um, preparation for the moon landing. So, if you wanted more proof, I mean, no offense. If you'd expect me to get in some kind of spacecraft hurtling around a ball at ridiculous speeds, 
you're going to have to improve the bill quality if you want me to get... <laughs> he keeps going on about these ridiculous speeds, but he just doesn't seem to understand orbital mechanics. Those speeds are necessary to stay in orbit. Not that you'd understand what orbit is. On board, that's for sure. Because let's have a look at this. Bearing in mind, no sound I should add, we know the globe's scientifically impossible anyway. No, it's not scientifically uh, impossible at all, Adam. And you've never been able to prove that it is. But when they show us footage like this, I mean, dear, oh dear. Dear, oh dear. See, this is all he's going to be doing. He's just going to point, point and say, look, it looks fake, it looks fake, it looks fake, look, it's fake. But you've never been able to prove how it's ever been faked or how it's CGI. None of you have. Again, the build quality of probably Blue Peter. Airfix wouldn't go anywhere near that. Look at it. Look at it. It's fine. It works. And it did work. You want to believe nonsense like that? No, I just believe demonstrable reality, Adam. <laughs> and drop demonstrable reality because of that? <laughs> you carry on. But for people like myself, I'm going to stick with real science that can be demonstrated. <laughs> Real science. Adam, you wouldn't know real science if somebody jumped up, slapped you in the face with a wet kipper and called you a twat on the way down. <laughs> I'm certainly not going to give it up for models that Airfix wouldn't even put their name to. <laughs> dear, oh dear. Look here. Yeah, I'm looking at it. It worked, Adam. A crude system of springs and levers, a build quality that Blue Peter would struggle to uh, entertain, to be quite honest with you, and stories that are off the chart as far as fantasy and, and myth and pantomime legend are concerned. Living on a cannibal flying through a vacuum, here's a tinfoil spacecraft as evidence, daft stories, springs and levers. Dear, oh dear. Again, you want. Except for none of it's actually made of tin foil, Adam. You just think it looks like tin foil because that suits your narrative. You want to believe it? You carry on. I don't abandon solid, fundamental truths because of Blue Peter build quality, daft stories, springs and levers in a vacuum, and anything else they chuck my way as far as trying to debunk reality. Well, Adam, I've already debunked your silly little video. Sorry, Adam, but your video has just been burned. Oh dear, outside, never mind. <laughs>